Can you start off by saying, Damon, what your response is to the Supreme Court ruling? It surprised many. Well, it certainly did surprise many, uh, but we weren't totally surprised. Uh, what the court essentially told us is that the lower court should uh, more faithfully apply the existing standard. There really is no new law coming out of yesterday's uh, decision. It's essentially the same strict scrutiny standard that always applied. But at base, we think that this is really a, a, a victory uh, for supporters of diversity and opportunity in higher education, and it's certainly a law, certainly at this point, for Abigail Fisher's counsel, who really thought that they would uh, really get to a chance to undo uh, what's been subtle precedent for some time. David, I wanted to get your response to Justice Clarence Thomas. Uh, he wrote in a concurring opinion the case uh, 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 he wrote in a concurring opinion that was longer than the majority opinion. Uh, Justice Thomas said uh, he wanted the court to, quote, hold that a state's use of race in higher education admissions is, categor is categorically prohibited by the Equal Protection Clause. He compared the arguments in favor of affirmative action to those who used to support segregation, calling them, quote, virtually identical. He added, quote, the use of race has little to do with the alleged education benefits of diversity and said, quote, slaveholders argue that slavery was a positive good that civilized blacks and elevated, and elevated them in every dimension of life. Can you respond? Uh, and can you also talk about what you expect to happen uh, once this case moves back down to the appeals court? Certainly. You know, and that, that opinion really uh, assumes facts, not an evidence. It assumes social science that simply doesn't exist. Uh, if it does exist, it's basically junk science. Uh, really, it contemplates a world uh, that ignores the fact that the Supreme Court upheld race-conscious affirmative action programs in Grutter versus Bollinger. Uh, I think the chief frustration that that opinion su uh, suggests or conveys is that the court didn't overrule Grutter or that it decided Grutter in the first place. If you even look at the citations to all of the different types of so-called evidence uh, indicated in that opinion, it's actually in information that predates the court's ruling in Grutter. So it's really not dealing with contemporary realities. It's not even dealing with contemporary law. And frankly, to compare uh, chattel slavery and legally mandated segregation to raise conscious affirmative action programs really defies logic. And we believe not only have most of the justices rejected that because no other justices joined that opinion, but most Americans would eject, reject rather that kind of logic as well. Damon, the petitioner in, in the case is Abigail Fisher, the woman who says she was rejected by the University of Texas because she's white. In this online video, Fisher billed her lawsuit against affirmative action as a challenge to discrimination. There were people in my class with lower grades who weren't in all the activities I was in who were being accepted into UT, and the only other difference between us was the color of our skin. A good start to stopping discrimination would be getting rid of the boxes on applications. Male, female, race, whatever. Those don't tell the admissions people what type of student you are or how involved you are. All they do is put you into a box. Get rid of the box. That's Abigail Fisher. Officially, she's the plaintiff in the Supreme Court case. But that's not the whole story. What's not widely known is that the case was, in fact, spearheaded by a man named Edward Bloom, a former stockbroker. He recruited Fisher after a long search for a student who could challenge affirmative action in court. He came across her because she happens to be the daughter of one of his old friends. Backed by the secretive right-wing group Donors Trust, Bloom has ensured that wealthy right-wing donors are covered covering Fisher's legal bills. In this video from 2008, Bloom makes an open appeal for Texas students to join his cause against affirmative action. This student here in Houston and thousands of other students throughout the state of Texas have been unfairly punished after UT decided to reintroduce race-based affirmative action. It's time for UT to stop. I encourage all high school students who have been rejected from UT to visit at utnotfair.org. Tell us your story. Contact us. If you've been rejected from UT, we want your story and we want to try to help you. According to Reuters, Edward Bloom has launched at least a dozen lawsuits against race-based protections in the United States. These also include the challenge to the Voting Rights Act by Alabama's Shelby County, which the Supreme Court could decide on today. Uh, Damon Hewitt, your response about his significance? Well, look, we won't disparage any individual in trying to seek access to the courts, but what we see here uh, and what Ed Blum and his organization have done is that they're telling—they're trying to tell America that race doesn't matter. 
But essentially what they're really saying in subtext is that the facts don't matter. Uh, the fact that Abigail Fisher would not have been admitted to the University of Texas, regardless of her race, uh, based upon undisputed evidence in the record in this case. Uh, the fact that in the Voting Rights Act case, which one of my colleagues argued before the Supreme Court uh, in the Shelby County case, uh, that Shelby County, Alabama, has one of the very worst records of discrimination of any jurisdiction in the country. Those facts don't matter to him, and that's troubling to us. And we think that's why the court uh, will move uh, cautiously and in a measured way, it did that certainly in a Fisher case, and we hope it also does that in the Voting Rights Act case as well. Mm -hmm.